Hi everyone and welcome back to the final panel of the first day of Femtech Leaders. Um, I don't know about you but it's been a great day so far um, and you know we have a fantastic uh, final panel. So big pharma and big medtech investment partnering and deal making across Femtech and women's health. It's quite a chunky title, it's quite a chunky topic. Um, once again you can ask any questions um, in the Q&A, um, we'll get them over to the uh, panelists as quickly as we can. It is a live panel so use the opportunity um, but uh, without further ado I'm gonna uh, hand you over to our moderator for the session Stephen from Clifford Chance so Stephen over to you. Great thanks very much Becky um, nice to be with you all today and um, and this uh, really interesting panel on investment partnering and deal making in femtech and uh, women's health. Uh, as Becky said, my name is Stephen Rees. Uh, I'm one of the healthcare partners uh, in Clifford Chance's healthcare practice and, uh, and delighted to be here today. Uh, we're joined by an amazing um, set of panelists, um, each of whom will uh, introduce themselves as we, uh, as we move on to the discussion. But I think let's get into it. Um, and I guess the first obvious question is, is pharma, is medtech really interested in investing in femtech and women's health? So maybe I'll ask uh, Jin, uh, your views on that. Thanks, Stephen. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today, and thanks for staying up. Um, I'm Jin from Astellas Pharma, uh, second largest pharma in Japan. I'm based in San Francisco. I lead digital health scouting, um, uh, as well as product and commercialization for Astellas uh, Global. Um, and to answer Stephen's question, I think Astellas Pharma especially is, is definitely interested in fintech and women's health, and largely because we do have a drug um, for VMS and menopause launching in 2023. So uh, women's health is a great deal part of my day job. Um, and I'm looking for partners to both partner in terms of product development, as well as commercialization. Um, and I also talk to our digital health venture fund pretty often. Um, which is a $70 million fund that also invests. Um, and in terms of partnership, in the past, we've done, um, for example, a, a deal with WellDoc, which in the digital diabetes space, where we gave them uh, $15 million to look at expanding their therapeutic area as well as to different regions. Thanks for having Great. me. No, th thanks, Jin. And and maybe uh, Gatti, could you um, could you give your view as well from um, yeah. from Pfizer? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Stephen. This is Gatti Derani. I'm part of um, Pfizer's Digital Innovation Lab. Uh, so, like Jin, I'm responsible for uh, scouting uh, external partners and startups that might be doing interesting work um, in areas that we're looking for solutions. Um, I would say maybe Pfizer is a little bit further behind Estellas um, in terms of focus on women's health. I think it's starting <laughs> to garner more interest as more and more investment dollars are going towards uh, femtech. Um, you know, Pfizer doesn't necessarily have a large women's health portfolio at the moment in terms of things that are particularly um, indicated for menopause or for endometriosis, et cetera. But we understand that women's health also expands to other disease states where there's a disproportionate share of patients that are female, um, things like autoimmune disorder, certain cancer types, um, and then also some certain rare diseases. So I think there's a, an interest growing in understanding how women's health can um, be incorporated into our business models. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you. A Amy, I was going to ask you the same question, but perhaps also, you know, what is the risk if, if uh, pharma and, and medtech doesn't have women's health and femtech at, at the forefront? What is the risk? Sure. So thank you. Um, again, my name is Amy West and I'm with Novo Nordisk. We're a leading global healthcare company, very focused on uh, looking to defeat diabetes and other serious chronic diseases such as obesity and, and other um, some rare um, blood and endocrine disorders. And my role at the company is leading our U.S. digital transformation and innovation team, where we're looking to focus on transforming how people experience healthcare through disruptive innovation. And as a part of that, you know, we're doing a lot to look at uh, partnerships with um, technology companies, startups, um, doing a lot of scouting in that space. And that includes the, the femtech space from the standpoint that um, you know, I think when we think about femtech, it's always very much focused on reproductive health, uh, fertility, 
Um, and, but, you know, women are so much more than their reproductive organs, whether it's, you know, earlier or, or later in life into menopause. And so when you think about a, a disease state or um, a disease state like diabetes, where in the US, one in nine women have type two diabetes, um, that's, a, that's a female centric uh, problem and, and challenge and need. And so, you know, that, that potential is huge if, if we enter it in the right way and we focus on women in, in the right way and under, you know, talking to them as, as women and engaging them in that way. Um, and if we don't do that, we risk, um, you know, the opportunity cost there is huge because other people are going to come into that space and they're, and they're going to see the opportunity and they're going to be able to, um, you know, leverage that need uh, and find the right solution. The, the, that innovation is going to happen. And if, if pharma isn't playing a, a role there, we're, we're going to lose out. And the, the market opportunity is significant in this space. Yeah, no, no, th th thank you. And, and maybe if I can move to uh, Annie Ruda, uh, a view maybe from the from the med tech side of the table. Sure, Stephen. So I'm Anirudh Dhammal. I'm responsible for the Women's Health uh, product line at Siemens Health in Years. Um, and to explain what women's health means for us, we are looking at breast imaging for breast cancer. So I can also expand on what Amy talked about in terms of looking beyond reproductive health and fertility. So what? So coming back to your initial question of why should we focus on women's health, uh, Stephen? Breast cancer is not just the most common form of female cancer; it is the most common form of cancer. So any company that is interested in oncology should look into breast cancer, right? Um, yep. The cost of treatment when you identify breast cancer in stage one is half that of a cost of treatment in stage four. And current expect estimations, you would be, so you have around one in eight women who have breast cancer. This, so if you keep aside the objective that there is a huge market here, there is also a huge opportunity to provide care by identifying cancers earlier, more accurately, and in a more meaningful way for care providers as well. Sure, understood, thank you. And um, I wonder if I can take the conversation, Gatti, maybe to talk about some of the, um, the strategies and trends uh, within within Femtech. Obviously it's a very, uh, you know, potentially described a very large um, area of activity, but, but what are the sort of strategies and trends that you are noticing? Yeah, no, Jeff, and I think, the, primarily the, the strategy or focus is being more representative of our patient population. So whether that's in clinical trial or that's in, uh, in line when our products are in the market and we're looking at disease management efforts, we really want to focus on the actual real world experience. And we all know that often things are created, protocols are created for a very homogenous population. Um, so we're, we're looking at becoming more representative in our real world data, uh, in our data analytics and understanding that marketplace, like uh, Anirudha was mentioning, breast cancer being the largest cancer out there in terms of um, you know, incidence, understanding how we can better identify the patient experience once they're managing the disease. That's really what we're focusing in. So when I'm looking at startups and I'm looking at companies that have femtech product outside of fertility or outside of, um, you know, the traditional women's health um, you know, categories, we're really looking at those that are capturing the data and helping us better understand that patient journey in the marketplace. Um, I also mentioned clinical trials. Uh, that's a huge kind of area that's growing. Um, I think more generally around the, the bucket of inclusion um, and, and equity and understanding that, you know, we're, we're looking at representative populations in clinical trials. Um, you know, heart disease, for example, affects women very differently than it does men. Um, a lot of the protocols that are written, a lot of the diagnoses, um, standards that are written are written for men. Um, so heart disease can look very different in, for um, a female and therefore be underdiagnosed or missed or lead to um, you know, greater kind of risk to the patient's life. So that's really what we're focused on. We're looking at companies that are capturing this data, helping us to upgrade and update these protocols that were written perhaps um, with the less um, broad patient segment in mind. 
And, and Amy, did, would you have a sort of different view within Novo or, or are you seeing other trends? Um, no, I would agree with that. And I think um, what's what's also important is, again, um, Novo Nordisk, we, we don't play in the traditional femtech space as far as fertility menopause goes. But again, sorry, got a phone going off here. Um, uh, however, when when you... I po apologize. The, the challenges of working from home. <laughs> Don't worry, we, we feel your pain. Do, um, do, you, do you want me to, to move to uh, to another panelist for a moment? It's, it's done now, sorry. I apologize. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> um, unbelievable. But um, uh, so again, we're, we're, you know, we um, have a lot of focus in the uh, diabetes and the obesity therapeutic areas. And these are two therapeutic areas that um, impact women quite a bit. And whether or not you are looking to engage with women and help them manage their disease state, we also think about it from the standpoint that many women um, who are heads of, you know, in the family are, are, we call them the chief medical officer of the family. They're the ones that are making a majority of the, the health decisions for their family as it relates to even other disease states beyond what, what the woman herself might be dealing with. So um, it's important to keep that in mind, I think, as we think about the femtech space and the, the power, the, the consumer power that the, the woman has in the household as it relates to healthcare decision-making. And so we keep that in mind as we think about, um, you know, how do we, how do we reach women um, in these disease states and also, how do we partner with uh, technology companies that are supporting women because they are they are a, a large part of the population that's affected by you know, diabetes and, and obesity? So we look at it from you know, um, from very early on in the R and D arms through through uh, clinical trials through to commercial opportunities. So across that entire uh, you know, asset development life cycle, we are looking at uh, potential partners that can um, understand uh, the, the female perspective on the disease state. Again, thinking about the experience, the journey, and all those other implications that might be playing a role in their ability to engage or not engage. So things like the social determinants of health, those are all part of the overall journey. So that and that journey and experience. So it's important for us to find partners that are, are tapped into those more holistic components and aspects of, of the overall experience. Yeah, un understood. And, and Jen, given your sort of role looking at investments, are, are there sort of particular areas and trends that you're you're particularly interested in or, or things that you're seeing spike in interest? Yeah, um, given our um, drug pipeline, uh, uh, I, I'm interested in all women's health, um, but I'm particularly interested in menopause. Um, and when I talk about that space, you know, there's has been a lot of, menopause has been really hot lately, no pun intended. Um, uh, investors uh, evaluate this space anywhere between 50 billion to sometimes 600 billion, um, looking at the Forbes article that came out in August this year. Um, in that space, in the menopause space, uh, we're looking at women age 40 to 65, um, anything in product space, device, symptom tracking apps, virtual care um, are all of interest. Um, and specifically, um, I think a lot of my former colleagues have also mentioned we're looking at solutions that helps with access of care. Um, so in, in my case, uh, access to menopause specialists, uh, or looking at education. Um, so how do you educate the patients as well as the doctors? Um, looking at integrative care, uh, especially with COVID, um, how can we move care from hospital to home um, and make it convenient, especially in femtech space, right, for the mom, for the sandwich generation, who are taking care of their elders, as well as their young. Um, and we're also looking at streamlining communication, 
uh, uh, between the other women in this case and also physicians, but also maybe other folks like pharmacists, um, the entire care team around her. Um, and then lastly, um, support networks from other women, from the physician, from the provider, from the specialist are all important um, topics yeah. that we're looking into. Good, great, thank you. And uh, in terms of the, the sort of diagnostics role, um, are, are you looking um, particularly from partnering with, with pharmaceutical opportunities within the diagnostic space or, or how Siemens looking at, uh, at that? Uh, so um, as I'm more on the imaging side, my exposure to the pharmaceutical industry is rather limited. This is a great panel for me, however, because I, I'm really getting to learn a lot here. Uh, Amy, I like the perspective on the CMO, the woman being the CMO for the family. That's a really, really nice way to put it. Um, so let me talk about what we are doing. Overall, Stephen, uh, it might not be completely relevant to pharma, but at least I can talk about the medical devices um, and imaging aspect. So we have three particular areas that we try to partner in. You know, one is, of course, companies that help us improve the clinical accuracy. Um, and clinical accuracy for breast cancer goes in two directions. One is identifying cancers more accurately. And the second one, which is currently the more important one is being very sure of saying when something is not a cancer. So if you look at the US alone, around 40 million women are screened annually. And majority of these, more than 95% of these won't have cancer. So you have to be really sure in an annual screening program that you're able to weed out without the normals as early as possible. The second aspect is, is the more operational aspect for healthcare providers. How can we make, make the entire process of screening this large amount of population as fast and as efficient as possible? Why do we have to focus on that particularly now? Well, because of COVID-19, there is a huge, huge amount of backlog of screening that is around worldwide. People haven't gone, and for all the right reasons, uh, for their annual or biannual mammograms in the last one and a half years. And the third aspect of it is, of course, making um, cancer care as economic as possible. And anywhere where we have technologies that help to um, make the entire process here yeah, across screening, diagnostics, therapy, and follow-up, make this entire process as economic as possible, um, we would be interested in, in technologies that help to do that. Uh, just to point out one, one example, we've partnered with a company called ScreenPoint Medical. ScreenPoint Medical offers artificial intelligence algorithms um, to parse through medical imaging data, particularly mammography images, and identify lesions. This helps pretty much across the entire gamut, right? It helps clinically, it helps operationally, it helps financially. Um, there are other applications, of course, that are out there that go more within the uh, the software is a medical device space, also within the area of apps that help with patient reported outcomes. And all of this, which again, as one of my fellow panelists put it, helping with the patient journey and making the patient journey as smooth as possible. Yeah, uh, uh, that, that's really helpful. Thank you. And and I was going to sort of take the conversation into so what what people are looking for in their investment uh, before making an investment and what some of those challenges are so, so maybe um if i go to, to to amy um to understand what you know what is it that that you would be looking for within the field of of, of femtech and you know what are the things that would really stand out um for an investment opportunity so again, I think it goes back to um, organizations that are um, deeply rooted in a a very real problem to solve uh, for the you know for um, the the female market and the the um, understanding of the experience, the overall journey. Um, to the, in, in a holistic way. It, it doesn't, it's not just a, a, a point type intervention. It really has to be that holistic understanding of um, 
the overall need and, and the experience going, you know, engaging with the healthcare ecosystem, where the challenges are. Um, and so really having that holistic understanding of the experience and in order to, to meet the need of the, of the end user. And then how do we then, um, you know, that's really sort of the, the fundamental strategic um, understanding and, you know, how does that fit into our overall um, strategy from a, from a Nova Nordisk standpoint? And then how, you know, what is the cultural aspect of, of the, of the entity that we are, we are, we are looking at? Um, there has to be a, a fit there as well. And so, so it goes beyond just, you know, the, the solution and the technology. It has to also be a working relationship between the, the, um, you know, our organization and their organization, and can we make this work? Um, and, you know, that, that's going to be a key to making sure that, um, that we can advance the opportunity through, um, you know, through, through the process and make sure that that's, you know, that it's, it's the right fit and that there is, you know, each side is bringing something to the table that, um, you know, it's sort of that mutual dependency that we need from each other in order to to um, find a solution that's going to work. Sure, uh, understood. And and uh, Gatti, would you say that there was um, is there any sort of difference in terms of what you would look at on investments? You know, return on investments for for opportunities in in femtech versus versus other areas. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think maybe similar to Jen, the, the innovation lab um, that I'm involved in, we're more interested in partnering um, with some of these com companies in the in the femtech space rather than acquisitions. Um, so we're looking at it a little bit differently. We're not necessarily looking at you know their term sheets or looking at their financial models to understand you know what their what their revenue structure is, but we're more interested in understanding what the reach uh, to the patient segments is. So if you can show a um, sustained kind of um, patient population that you have access to, um, that's something that we'd look to um, you know that has a lot of weight. Um, another area of, of you know, high interest is, I mentioned earlier, like data capture and being able to analyze and assess that data and provide it to us in packaged solutions that help us either create better um, patient engagement um, solutions or help us better do recruitment, you know, whatever it may be across our kind of life cycle in the pharma space. Um, and then kind of a, a third um, interesting area that's, that's um, been evolving recently. Um, I think it goes more towards, um, you know, Amy's comment around the, the CMO. Um, we're interested in helping patients from access affordability standpoint make better decisions about their healthcare. So if um, we've started to tap into the fintech industry and understand uh, firms that are able to help patients um, navigate um, reimbursement or help navigate um, high cost disease areas, I mean, pharma and Pfizer uh, specifically is, um, you know, set to launch um, some really high cost products in the, in the near future in the rare disease space or orphan uh, drug space in, in gene therapy particularly is, is going to be um, very different from a cost model standpoint than uh, some of the chronic diseases. So we're really interested in helping that patient. And in, if, if it is the case, the, the mother, or the, the caregiver, the woman of the family um, to help navigate some of those financial areas of concern as well. So um, these are some areas that I thought to mention that might be a little bit um, different than what has already been mentioned. Sure, no, that, that's great. And and Jin, if I can sort of come to you and and get your perspective as well on on those challenges that there may be for investment. Yeah, um, so uh, thanks. Prior to this role, I actually was a Series A and B investor at Providence Ventures, which is the third largest nonprofit hospital system in the U.S. They have a three hundred million dollar fund uh, corporate venture looking at investment um, that will benefit health systems uh, in the provider space. And then before that, I was at Humana um, Innovation and Ventures, which looking at the payer space. Um, investment for Astellis Pharma uh, comes in few folds. Um, first, we have different funds for different um, 
products. So one that I'm particularly uh, familiar with is in the digital health space. Um, is a $70 million fund called Digitex. Uh, we do mostly C investments, um, check size range, anywhere between one to five mil. Um, and when um, it, it's, a, it's a wholly owned by Astellas, but they uh, operate differently, uh, separate from corporate. So I will see a lot of companies and then share with them and vice versa. For them, um, they're looking at from a traditional investor lens, right? You're looking at the team, the product, and the market and traction. Um, so every investor you talk to, they're going to ask you those three things: um, uh, who's the jockey, who, what's the horse, um, and how is the opportunity, and how you're going to make money for them. Um, so definitely nail that <laughs> before you talk to any investor. Uh, for my day job, uh, Stellos, um, similar to Getty, um, we. Uh, we look at partnerships, um, both to help with the product, also with commercialization, not only in the US, but globally. Um, so there, we're really looking at um, you know, what makes you truly unique, um, what information you get that nobody else has, and what your reach is like. Um, because as you can imagine, big pharma also means big processes and long. Um, so for um, our, you know, to get, contract sign typically takes a couple months. Um, so for innovators out there, is that something your team can afford um, to wait on? Um, typically the answer is no, um, because you're looking at the, signing the next contract as soon as possible so you can show to your investors. So there is, is those type of risks and reward that you have to balance. Um, my recommendation is to do both, right? Have um, definitely seek those early contracts that you can sign, but um, be you know open an eye for these establish establishing these long term relationships where pharma can help you once you become bigger. Sure. You know, I would just like to add, jump in on that too. I think that's a really important point and and something I was trying to touch on a bit. Um, this idea of the the culture um, in in partnering. Um, you know, big pharma and startups, or you know, even late stage um, early technology companies. Um, they, they do have different financial resources and needs, and they're not always on the same pace or the same track. And um, it's really important that as you're building these partnerships or you're, you're looking to partner, that there is an understanding there and an, um, an alignment on what can be expected because in big pharma, it is not a, things don't happen quickly. And for a smaller you know, tech or startup, that can be life and death, like 30, you know, months, you could be living months and months in some situations. So you have to really be thinking about how you're going to make the relationship work based on your objectives and what your uh, financial considerations are um, when you're dealing with, with a large um, pharma organization. Things just go very differently. They're much slower and there's, the decision-making process is much slower. Uh, understood. And, and I think I just want to take um, a question from the audience, because I think it's quite pertinent to, to the conversation we've just been having. Um, but it's the million dollar question um, that everybody, uh, every founder is starting out, which is you know, what, um, you know, what should a founder be doing from the outset, from planning in order to get the attention of the big pharma or the big med tech, um, you know, to get them interested in the investment. Uh, wh whether any any of our panelists have any sort of views, things that you, maybe you've seen that have really stood out historically. Any sort of views there, Gatti? Yeah, I can add to that. Um, you know, typically when I'm um, advising a startup um, around a question like that, what I would point them to is. Um, looking at the guidelines or um, the patient reported outcomes that are of interest to pharma in that specific disease population. So, you know, when you pitch to pharma, often what you'll have is you'll have people in the room that are very therapeutic focused. Um, you know, we have brand teams and they live and breathe um, the, whatever disease area they're working on. So, 
if you can speak kind of their language and talk about the specific guidelines, let's say for COPD, the guidelines are, uh, I, I think, I don't know if it's still current, but the, the gold guidelines, for example, if you can show that you have a good clinical understanding of that therapeutic area and you're able to either customize or revise your product to match the needs of that specific therapeutic um, population, that's really going to um, garner interest. Um, Another kind of area to, to focus on or plan towards um, as you're looking to engage with pharma uh, eventually is look at who our customers are in the end, right? So our customers are specialty pharmacies, our customers are health plans, our customers are, are companies like Siemens. So we're really interested in um, your potential partnerships with some of these organizations, um, you know, particularly let's say um, patient advocacy groups. If you if you have a product uh, in the breast cancer space or serving the population of um, women that have breast cancer, are you plugged into uh, the the key advocacy groups? Have you uh, been endorsed by? Um, particular patient assistance groups. So that sort of um, partnering helps us to also, um, you know, be more welcoming, I guess, um, is the best word uh, to your product or your solution. And I just want to uh, echo uh, Amy and Jen's point that, you know, unfortunately, the pharma life cycle of bringing in, um, you know, pilots or bringing in new programs is long. Um, I've seen as long as two years. I, I went out, like the last time I went out on maternity leave, um, uh, we, we started a conversation with a startup. And when I came back, um, my daughter was six months old and we had just signed the contract. So, you know, it, it can take a long time. Um, so yeah, it, I think it's, it's good to come in knowing that that runway is going to be a little bit longer with pharma um, and, and, you know, kind of having that patience and, and the financial uh, stability to have that patience. Sure. And, and, and maybe I uh, step in here. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, can you move any faster in MedTech? <laughs> um, unfortunately not. Uh, so I can just take over what everyone else said. It takes time with larger companies. The larger the company, the more time it takes uh, to do a deal. And while I do not have experience as being an investor, I can speak of what would it take for me as a partner to be interested in a company. Um, and I'm now drawing upon experiences that I have with other partners that we already have within the fold and that we talk to. So whatever helps me look good towards my customer will grab my attention. If somebody comes to me and says, hey, here is a product that works exceptionally well with your product um, and helps to improve the clinical output of your product, I would be immediately interested. So coming back to the question that you raised, Stephen, so what would I advise startups to focus on? First and foremost, please make sure there is clinically relevant data. You have clinically relevant proof points. Um, please make sure you have a good idea of what the regulatory approval process looks like. And I don't mean here, please make sure that you're approved for the UMDR and the FD and all of that, but have a fair understanding of what it means and whether you have the bandwidth to go for these regulatory approvals. The third, um, and this is a big difference between pharma and medtech, our markets are comparatively smaller. Right? So for the whole of breast cancer imaging, uh, the market would sit between eight to 10 billion. Um, it's still a huge number and there are huge opportunities within this, but this is relatively smaller compared to uh, the markets that we would see on breast cancer in terms of therapy, treatment and pharma. Um, what this means is whatever we have as a partnering product has to have a real world impact, has to have something that is scalable, um, what works for screening 500,000 women will not work when you're scaling this up to 40 million women. Yeah? Um, and scalability is not just on the commercial side, scalability is more important on the operations side. The faster we are scaling these kind of screening programs, um, um, a large med tech company cannot be dependent on uh, or cannot wait for the smaller partner to ramp up at the same speed. So the processes have kind of to be thought of um, well in advance. And finally, does the partner help me in increasing access? Currently, 65% of the women in even a mature market like the US are screened. Does the partner help us to increase this further? I mean, are we increasing access to care globally? 
Can we target the people who are currently missed across screening, diagnosis, treatment? Can we help them, those who don't have this access today? Yeah, great, thank you. And and Jen, uh, I was going to come to you. Um, I, I see you. Uh, great, you, you're still there. Just to see whether you uh, you had a view. You had a, the great sort of horse racing analogy of jockeys and and horses. Um, and just picking up on that question for, from the audience about what founders should be doing at the outset, obviously to make their horses and their jockeys look like they're going to win the race. Um, so I, I used to live in Louisville, Kentucky, <laughs> so hence horse racing. Um, I, I think I think there's a lot of things, right? Um, I, I, I've been an entrepreneur myself. It's, it's a very, very difficult job, um, other than being a mother, I would say. Um, um, I, I, think, I think on the onset, uh, you just have to be smart and go, uh, go focus. Um, so whoever mapping out, you know, what market segment is worth going for, uh, sometimes pharma and medtech is not your answer. Maybe, you know, if you're a B2C company, you should focus on the users themselves and not us. Um, um, and, and really be the expert in the little niche domain that you're in. Um, Cause once you're the expert in that piece, then you'll track attention from outsiders like pharma and medtech um, and we'll come to you. Um, Cause we, you know, go to conferences like this. Uh, we, we, we have teammates who scouts. Um, so I think your job as the founder is be the best thing you can be in your domain and, and really hone in on the measurable metrics, uh, like user engagement, revenue, not vanity metrics, uh, number of press and, and conference you speak at doesn't really matter, unfortunately. Uh, it helps, um, but at the end of the day, it is that um, user engagement, any changes in clinical outcomes, um, and then of course revenue. Great, thank you. So uh, another question I wanted to raise, um, uh, th th there are, I think, some uh, smaller companies that may be slightly trepidatious of engaging with big pharma or, or big tech, but equally, you know, they need to do it, they need the money, they need the opportunity, but they're concerned as to what the implications may be for their business going forwards as to their own exit strategies. I don't know whether the panel can give um, any comfort to to our audience um, as to what partnering uh, with pharma or, or tech is like, and and you know where that where that leaves those companies in the future for their own exit strategies or their own growth strategies, just because they've done one deal with pharma. Uh, Gatti, I don't know if you have a view on that. Yeah, I can take that. I mean, um, I think it's always good to get on pharma's radar. Um, particularly as you're raising funding, um, you know, folks like Jen and I and Amy, you know, we're tracking the market. We see what firms are out there and what they're doing. Um, I think it's always, um, it's always good to sign with a pharma company because then the other pharmas start looking at you more closely. I know that's happened um, with, the, with a lot of uh, startups where, um, you know, companies like Sanofi um, Ventures or others, and, and I used to work for Sanofi, so I can speak to that. Um, you know, the companies all of a sudden start garnering interest when they've signed with another one. So um, it's a, you know, very, very competitive um, industry. We have so many um, players and, and um, competitors and you know, a, quite a, a limited set of diseases where we have um, solutions from a product standpoint. So whether it's clinical trials and we're trying to recruit, let's say for a NASH uh, focused study or um, uh, you know, asthma related study, um, most of our competitors have products in that space as well. So um, I think that um, the sooner the better uh, to get on pharma's radar, maybe um, you know, don't hang your hat on signing a contract right away, um, but keep us aware, keep folks like myself and Jen and Amy uh, abreast of what you're working on and what you're doing so that when the time is right, we can pull you into the right conversations and potentially um, you know, work on a pilot um, or pass you to our venture team for investment discussions. And, and, and Amy, how um, how would you see it from Novo, and, and how would Novo feel if one of its partnering uh, opportunities was taken over by another large farmer? 
Um, well, I think um, it uh, Gatti raises a really, really good point in that I think pharma, we're, big pharma is always a little, we're, we're tentative, we're very risk averse um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, we tend to be, I think, fast um, or consider ourselves fast followers. It's always a little scary to be the first one out there um, and make a big investment if it doesn't work out. You know, it's, it, it can just be a real challenge. And so, you know, if we see somebody else making a move in a certain space or with certain partners, um, it creates an attraction there. And um, it's always painful. And I've been through this quite a bit where we've um, identified a number of potential partners that would be great. And then the next thing you know, because we, we weren't fast enough, um, it's, been, it's been taken on by another partner. And we've obviously seen over the last few years, all the, um, um, the, the, the sort of the, the purchases that are going on, the consolidations of, of different players in the space. So it's, um, you know, it's, I think we're all kind of learning as we go in, in, in this, in this sort of technology, um, as we're looking to, you know, transform our core pharmaceutical businesses, which has, have always been anchored, at least pharma has been anchored in the molecule as the asset, we're not technology companies. So we're, we're starting to get more comfortable with combining these these areas together because the reality is the future of healthcare is going to be um, a combination of, of all these things, the, the pharmacotherapy, the medical devices, the med tech, and um, the, the, the technology and data as, aspects that are going to create that ability to engage in all these things because medication alone isn't gonna solve the problem. A medical device on its own isn't gonna solve the problem. But again, we're still trying to figure out how we work together. And I think a lot of it goes back to some of the, the cultural challenges, the risk, um, the risk tolerance challenges, um, the financial challenges of, you know, you know, how we're going to allocate resources because we have them, or how we're going to get resources because we don't have them if you're a small startup. And so, it's it's just starting to create this awareness in the market and. Um, the other, the other piece too, uh, kind of going back to a question that you asked earlier, Stephen, about how to get on, you know, as a smaller tech company, how to get on the radar of the larger pharma organizations or the larger healthcare organizations. It, you know, in, in very simple terms, it's, you know, how, how are you going to help them solve their problem? And um, I think it was um, Anna Runda who had mentioned that if you're going to, if you're going to show, if you can show me something that's going to, um, deliver a benefit for my business, whether that is getting my product into the hands of uh, my customer faster, of um, proving the real world value um, or the differentiation of my product in a very um, competitive market, I'm going to listen to you. And if you can help me prove the outcome to the other stakeholders, to the payer sides, to the healthcare system sides, that's going to help me position my product in a way that's going to benefit um, the, the overall ecosystem, I'm gonna pay attention to that as well. Sure. So um, it's a number of things. Uh, understood, that's great. And, and given g given the comment just there about you know, timing and, and risk averse, uh, just for our audience, it, would you say there was any difference um, in terms of doing a partnering deal versus an M&A transaction from a timing perspective, Jin, would you have a different view on timing? You um, me... Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, I, I think it depends how the entrepreneurs want to frame it. Um, so for investments, um, it's, it's much easier for any investor to take a call with you if the relationship already exists. So even when you're not ready for investment, you should be at least brief friendly to share information, um, um, especially if we're reaching out to you. Because um, you never know what's gonna happen down in the, in the row. In terms of partnering, 
uh, for commercial deals and product side. Um, I think the stage, at least for Stellis, tend to be later uh, because we're looking at ready to go markets with proven tractions and clinical outcomes. Um, and, and when pharma you know, get involved, we're really looking at um, leveraging our sales force to help you scale. Um, Right. If yep. if that if you're not at that stage, um, there's not really value we could provide you, and that's not a good deal for us. Um, so sure. we won't want to do that, anyways. Great. Okay. And, and I appreciate we're sort of coming up to time, but um, Anuru, did you have any different view uh, on M and A versus partnering? So most of what I'd like to say has been said already. Um, so what? And this is not my experience which is not really statistically relevant in terms of the number of deals but what i've seen is typically partnering is faster and has a lower risk for both the parties so if somebody is not is tentative about whether you know you really want to get into a relationship with somebody else try the partnering approach that might be significantly simpler than an m a or an investment that's great. Thank you. So, so it sounds very much, uh, you know, very clear, good advice. Know your audience, know your data, know your indication and technical space um, and present the problem that you have the solution to. That sounds, seems to be the advice uh, coming from our panelists. I, I don't know if any of our panelists have a, any sort of final comment before we wrap up at all. Um, but, but if not, certainly our audience can uh, find your details uh, through the uh, th th through the system. But any further final comments, Amy, at all? Um, you know, I would just say, well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I would, you know, just to like to reinforce going back to the, the femtech opportunity that that market potential is huge. Um, and according to a report I saw by Frost and Sullivan that the revenue from Femtech is, is expected to reach 1.1 billion by 2024. So um, it's um, something that, that pharma and the rest of the healthcare ecosystem really needs to take seriously. And also think about it beyond just the traditional reproductive health and fertility type of um, focus. Great, thank you. Uh, Gatti, I don't know if you have any final comments. No, I, I think we've we've covered it all. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to, you know, reiterate that it, it's never too early to get um, in contact with uh, folks at Pharma. You know, start the conversation, and we love seeing companies grow and, um, you know, engaging in conversation when the time is right. Um, and if you can make it through med legal review with another company, then uh, we're very much likely to talk to you, um, as Amy kind of pointed out. Thank you. Great. Any Ruda? So, nothing much to add from my side as well. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I'd just like to tell the people who are listening, there is a huge market. Uh, there's no one company that's going to solve all the world's problems. Yeah, we'll, we need to partner. We need to talk to each other. Um, nobody will complain of having one more conversation with a particularly interesting technology. Great, thank you. And, and Jen, a final word. Yeah, I, I just want to congratulate for already, you know, signing on to this conference. That means you're interested in this space. All the women in the world needs you, <laughs> um, and and we will, we'll, uh, you know, some some of you will go really big, and some of you might do a pivot. Um, but we're here to help whenever you need us. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you uh, to my panel. Uh, that's been really informative for me and hopefully for our audience as well. As I said, uh, you should be able to uh, find uh, all of the panelists uh, through the system. Uh, but thank you all very much for joining today. Thank you so much, Stephen. And uh, as you said, thank you so much to all of the panelists. Um, you know, I, I know this panel was uh, about many things, but obviously we've ended on partnering. Um, you know, as Stephen mentioned, um, you know, we're all for partnering, we're all for talking. Um, that's what the event is about. That's what the platform is for. So reach out on the platform if you haven't done so already, you know, get those meetings booked in, um, you know, connect on LinkedIn and just basically carry on the conversation. But a huge thank you to all of the panelists again, a huge thank you to everyone that's participated in uh, Femtech Leaders Day One. 
that's it for today. Um, but we'll be back here um, bright and early, well, relatively early. There'll, there'll, there'll be a little lion for those of you joining us uh, for the 11 a.m. panel uh, BST. Um, but I will see you tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah, see you then. Bye.